This is Open to Debate. I'm John Donvan. Hi, everybody. 34 felony convictions. That is the criminal record that now belongs to a man who is running for president, Donald Trump. At least now that record belongs to him because it could go away. Like everybody, Trump has the right of appeal, the right to initiate a process to get those convictions tossed out. And he is appealing this. Does he have grounds, strong grounds, or not so strong, or none at all? That's what we're asking in this episode about the law under the flag of our mock trial series, where we ask legal experts to take opposing sides so that we can hear the arguments that a courtroom might hear in a case of public interest. Just to be clear, in this case, the hush money trial has concluded, but we are focusing on what is yet to come, Trump's appeal of his convictions. Appeals are not decided by a jury, but by judges, a panel of three judges in this case. And a quick reminder of what Trump was found guilty of by the County of New York, falsifying business records in the first degree 34 times. What raised this to first degree status was the jury's determination that the fraud was committed in pursuit of another crime, which was trying to influence the 2016 election with payments made by his one-time lawyer to an adult film performer to buy her silence about a sexual encounter. Now, I'd like to introduce our opposing counsel, arguing that this conviction should be thrown out. I want to say hello to Randy Zellin. Randy is a career trial attorney with over 30 years of experience and an appointment at Cornell Law School, and taking the opposite side, saying that the conviction should stand. Erwin Chemerinsky, a legal scholar and dean of UC Berkeley's law school, welcome to both of you to Open to Debate. Hi, thank you for having me. Delighted to be with you. And now let's metaphorically all rise and gavel in the proceedings around our question, should Trump's conviction stand? For you, our audience, I'd like you to imagine yourself as among the panel of judges who are going to hear this case and listen to the arguments being made. Listen closely, please. Randy, this is your turn. You are up first. You are here to make the case that these convictions should be tossed. This is your chance to tell us why. Wiser folks than me have said, no man is above the law. I respectfully submit that no law is above one man. May it please the court, counsel, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Randy Zellin and I represent the appellant Donald J. Trump. Much like the parents who have a right to notice an opportunity to be heard, the right to be informed of why their child is being wrested away from them, the ability to defend themselves. Donald Trump was entitled to those same procedural and substantive due process rights that the Constitution guarantees to all of us. Before you take away my liberty, I have the right to know what it is that I've done wrong, I have the right to hire counsel to defend me. I have the right to be assured that when the case is over, I can't be charged again. And I have the right to be heard. And I resp respectfully submit that this verdict is the product of a justice of the Supreme Court essentially telling the jury the Fifth, Sixth Amendment, as applied to New York State through the 14th Amendment, those constitutional rights when it comes to Mr. Trump can be given the week off, that they don't apply to him, that he does not need to know why the charges have been elevated against him from a misdemeanor where the statute of limitations long ran out to a felony 34 times. Imagine being blindfolded and being dumped somewhere in a field. All you know is that you're somewhere in New York. It's too cloudy to know where the North Star is. You have no directions. You have no flashlight. You have no way to know where you're going. Such was the indictment that was presented and put before Donald J. Trump. In the time that I have with the justices. I will choose my battles wisely. My brief reflects the fact that I respectfully submit that Justice Mershon was handcuffed by an appearance, a conflict 
that could not be waived and could not be ignored. I will not spend time today discussing whether New York City could afford Mr. Trump a fair and impartial trial. And I will not go into the Stormy Daniels testimony being the poster child of prejudice. I'm going to focus my time with you all on now three critical issues. One, the Supreme Court of the United States ruling that there is a presumption when it applies and when it comes to the president of the United States, a presumption of immunity for his official acts. And if your honors please, the earliest date of the offense conduct in the indictment is February 14th, 2017. Mr. Trump was sworn in as 45th president of the United States on January 20th, 2017. Right then and there, this verdict should be gone. But there are other compelling arguments that are in my brief that warrant our time together. And that is an indictment that purposefully failed to advise the former president what the offense conduct was that elevated the misdemeanors to a felony. And jury instructions that were no more than a poo-poo platter where the jury could decide, not unanimously, what the underlying offense conduct was. Those were unconstitutional. Those were taking the Constitution and tossing it aside. And for those reasons, if Your Honor, please, this verdict is unconstitutional. This verdict should be fired. Thank you. Thank you, Randy Zellin. And now, uh, Aaron Chemerinsky, it is your turn to make the opposite case. You are arguing that these convictions should stand. This is your opportunity to explain why. Thank you. May it please the court. After a five-week trial, a jury in New York convicted Donald Trump on 34 felony counts. This is a crucial vindication of the rule of law. No one, not even a former president, is above the law. The question that was posed is, how likely is it that the appellate court reverse the convictions? It's incredibly unlikely. The appellate court in New York reverses convictions only 4 to 6 percent of the time. And here, where the evidence is so overwhelming, where the jury on all 34 counts is unanimous, it's clear that the convictions will be affirmed. There is no basis for reversal. Randy offers two arguments here. First, he says that Donald Trump was protected by absolute immunity based on the United States Supreme Court decision in Trump versus United States on July 1st of this year. My simple response to that is nonsense. The Supreme Court said that a president has absolute immunity for official acts taken while in office. Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the court, said it's an official act if it's exercising a constitutional power or statutory authority. What Donald Trump did was order falsification of personal business documents. In fact, Chief Justice Roberts, at the end of the opinion, made clear that there are limits to the immunity of the president. There is no immunity for political or personal acts, only official ones. And Randy never suggests, because it can't be suggested, that Donald Trump's falsification of business records had anything to do with carrying out the powers of the presidency. Second, Randy argues, that due process was violated because Donald Trump received constitutionally inadequate notice. Here, the Supreme Court has been clear that what's required is there be reasonable notice under the circumstances. The constitutional requirement, according to In re Oliver in 1991, is sufficient notice to allow a criminal defendant to be able to respond to the charges. Notably, Randy never mentions that in February, the trial judge issued a 30-page ruling detailing the charges against Donald Trump. What was the case against Donald Trump? It was based on three allegations. First, that Donald Trump caused money to be paid to Stormy Daniels so she wouldn't reveal the sexual affair they'd had. Second, that business records were falsified to hide that Donald Trump did this. And the third, that Donald Trump did this 
so as to help his candidacy for presidency of the United States. Can anyone who listened to the evidence deny that Donald Trump caused the money to pay to Stormy Daniels, that business records were falsified, or that this was done to help him be elected as president of the United States? What we're talking about here is the New York Penal Law, Section 175.10, and it requires three elements, false entry of business records, an intent to defraud, and that it be an intent to further another crime. Well, in this instance, what was alleged was that Donald Trump falsified 34 business records, 11 checks, 11 monthly invoices, 12 entries in a ledger, and that he did so to help himself get elected. How could anyone who listened to the evidence have doubt about that? How realistically could Donald Trump or anyone say they didn't have notice about these charges were going to be about. Now, if the indictment wasn't perfect, if the jury instructions weren't perfect, there is a doctrine in law called harmless error. And what everyone in the jury needs to ask themselves is, did Donald Trump have adequate notice of the crimes? Did Donald Trump have the opportunity to respond at trial to that which was alleged? Would it have made the slightest difference if the indictment had been more specific, didn't Trump know all along what was being alleged and what he was being accused of? The jury instructions were clear. The jury verdict was emphatic. 34 counts, 34 times guilty. And the Court of Appeal should affirm. Thank you very much, Erin. And thank you to both of you for your opening statements. We have a clear idea of where you both stand. I just want to ask you to help us set the table and move forward the agenda for the next session um, by asking each of you in very brief form, what you consider to be the, the single most egregious flaw in your opponent's argument. Billboard length. Randy, you go first. No idea what the offense conduct was that elevated the misdemeanor to a felony and no way that 12 people were permitted to unanimously determine what that offense conduct was. They were permitted to pick and choose. Four, four, and four could have each different reasoning. Erwin, I want to take the same question to you. What is the most egregious flaw in your opponent's argument? Donald Trump and everyone knew that he was being accused of authorizing payments to Stormy Daniels, falsifying business records to hide it, and to help himself get elected president of the United States. There was no doubt about that in anyone's mind. We have with us two attorneys who have laid out their arguments for why the conviction should be overturned or why it should stand. Randy Zellin is arguing for the appeal and Erwin Chermansky is arguing against. And here in their opening statements, we heard Randy say that fundamentally he feels that President Trump uh, has legal rights which were not safeguarded in this trial. He also points out that the, uh, the recent decision by the Supreme Court uh, uh, establishing the president's absolute immunity uh, for involvement in official acts has an enormous impact on this case and supports the appeal. We are hearing from uh, Erwin Chemerinsky um, that uh, he's saying that basically this trial was a vindication of the rule of law because nobody is above the law. He says there absolutely is no basis for reversal, and he has points to counter um, the, 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 the essence of Randy's opening argument. But as we get to that opening argument, Randy, I want to go back to you and ask you to address uh, the fundamental argument that um, Irwin made in summing up his opening argument, fundamentally that nobody can doubt. He says nobody can doubt that what President Trump did was in fact falsify records and did so with the goal of defending his opportunity to get elected in 2016 and potentially reelected in 2020. That it's just, un it can't be doubted. What is your response to that? Only half of that is reflected in the indictment and only half of that was reflected in the evidence until the attorneys presented their closing arguments. Surely, the fact that there were false entries made in the books and records of the business was established. But those are only misdemeanors and the statute of limitations long expired. Nowhere in the indictment does the indictment say that there was offense conduct done by the former president in order to further or conceal another crime. And it was not until closing arguments 
that the prosecution finally gave up the ghost and talked about what it was. And then astonishingly, astonishingly, the judge instructed the jury that they had a choice. They could find that they that the offense conduct, the underlying offense conduct was either violations of state election law, violations of federal election law or violations of state tax law. Never. Let, let me um, sure. I, I want to jump in to help our audience who who may need a little bit of information uh, about uh, context for what you're talking about. Fundamentally, Randy, your argument is resting on the fact that normally something like falsifying records would be treated as a misdemeanor. But if the falsification is established to be in service of committing another crime, then it gets escalated to a felony. And that that's what happened with the charges in this case, that the there was an assumption that the falsification had the purpose of um, of um, trying to influence the election unlawfully, which would be against the law. I have that part right, correct? Yes. For both of you? And, and, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about another And let crime. me give you the classic examples of when the statute is used. And, and I've been doing this for a minute or two, and I've seen a couple of indictments in my time, and I've tried a couple of cases in my time, both state and federal. Typically, the falsification aspect is almost a throwaway. In other words, you have a client charged with committing insurance fraud. And in order to get the insurance company to pay a claim, the defendant provides the insurance company with fake documentation, with fake books and records in order to support the insurance claim. In a tax fraud claim, typically you will see tax fraud charges. And as part of the tax fraud charges, the defendant provides the government with fake books and records to support, I shouldn't pay so much in taxes because I didn't show this much income. The books and records are fake. In this particular instance, Donald Trump had no idea. The indictment was silent on what that other crime was. Erwin, um, what we're hearing from Randy is the fact that this escalation from misdemeanor to felony with the argument that there was a, an intention to influence the election is somewhat bogus, somewhat unestablished, and, was, and, and, the, and the case wasn't really laid out for the president as, as part of the process of, of the trial itself. What's your response to that? I think that's simply wrong. Let me also brush aside. Twice Randy has referred to the statute of limitations. No one contended that the statute of limitations had expired on the felony charges that were the basis for the conviction here. Now, in terms of what was alleged, the indictment made clear that Donald Trump was being accused of causing hush money paid to Stormy Daniels, falsifying business records to cover up, and to help himself get elected as president of the United States. If you listen to the oral arguments, at the opening statement, this is what the prosecutor emphasized. In the closing argument, this is what he stressed. Randy's argument is also simply wrong as a matter of law. The United States Supreme Court in Shad versus Arizona said, and I quote, that the criminal indictment need not specify which overt act among several named was the way in which the crime was committed. You don't have to identify the separate crimes in order to give reasonable notice. Again, what I think Randy is doing is obscuring common sense here. Everyone has to ask themselves, did Donald Trump know he's being accused of authorizing hush money paid to Stormy Daniels? Did he authorize business records to be falsified to do this? And did he do this to help himself get elected the president of the United States? It, it, but the problem is the indictment, nowhere in the 43 pages of the indictment does it say, and I invite counsel to point to one line in the 43 pages that talks about whether the other offense conduct was in furtherance of violating state election law, in furtherance of violating federal election law, or in furtherance of violating state tax law. And as I said, when it comes to the Constitution, and nobody knows this better than my adversary, you are entitled to notice of what it is that you've done wrong uniformly so everybody knows what's expected of them and when they cross the line. And everyone is entitled to know that once the case is adjudicated, 
I can't be re-prosecuted. And the mere fact that the indictment was silent on the offense conduct and the jury was not required to be unanimous on whether the underlying offense conduct was state election law fraud, federal election law fraud, or state tax law fraud, the former president has no way of knowing whether or not he can be re-prosecuted on any one of those three theories again. There are many flaws with that. First, what you're specifying here is the indictment and what it has to include. The indictment doesn't have to specify this in order for it to be constitutionally adequate. All that's necessary, as In Ray Oliver said, is reasonable notice so Donald Trump could know he was being accused of ordering the falsification of business records to help himself get elected president. The second point that I think is really important here is you say that the jury might have found, based on different motivations, why he was guilty. But again, there's a Supreme Court case on point that you ignore. It's McKay versus North Carolina, and it's in 1990. And there, Justice Blackmun says, there is no general requirement that the jury reach agreement on the preliminary factual issues which underlie the verdict. In the Shad case, the court further clarified that juries are allowed to combine findings on alternative means of satisfying the elements of the crime. The law is simply against your position. Well, you, you just threw out the entire criminal RICO statute where the jury is required to unanimously agree on what the not only are their predicate acts or what they are and what they are. The jury does not have the ability to have some of them say, well, it's wire fraud and others say, no, it's mail fraud and others say, no, it's bankruptcy fraud. They must unanimously agree. So what you are really doing is taking out of context context one particular example, but that is not where the law is clear. The statute is clear. The prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt to, to a unanimous jury what the underlying offense conduct was. What, was, what offense conduct was concealed? What other crime was concealed? what other crime was done in furtherance of. And you've yet to articulate either in the indictment or in the evidence any moment that the prosecution said it was to commit state tax law violation. Okay, it Erwin, I want to give you 45 seconds to respond to that, and then I want to move on to another issue. Sure. The jury found that there was the intent to defraud by falsifying 34 different business records. And the jury was asked an opening statement in the evidence which you just referred to, and in the closing argument, that Donald Trump's purpose in doing this was to help himself get elected as president. Which is you not ask a me for evidence. No, please. You ask me for evidence. Hope Hicks testified that Donald Trump was very concerned that if this came out, it could hurt him getting elected. That was the evidence. There was no doubt in the jury's mind that what this was about was falsifying business records to help him get elected president of the United States. Here's where I want to move now, and that is the fact that the Supreme Court has decided that presidents have uh, absolute immunity in the pursuit of their official duties, that they cannot be criminally prosecuted if, some, if for, for anything they do in the course of official action. You referred to this in your opening, uh, Randy, as you said it would have an enormous impact. My question to you is, would, would, these, would this not have to impact um, official duty, and how could the th activities that the president is accused of or has been found guilty of here, how do they qualify as official duties as opposed to private duties? If you recall, in my opening statement, I was very careful on the words that I used right out of the decision. There is a difference between absolute immunity, where the president's acts are official, they are conclusive, and the actual words are conclusive and preclusive. In those instances, the president has absolute immunity. I didn't say that. What I said was there is also the issue of presumptive immunity, which could possibly be rebutted. And in this particular instance, presump presumptive immunity attaches by mere virtue of timing. The earliest date that the indictment and the proof showed criminal wrongdoing it was February 14th, 2017. That was the first of the 34 acts. President Trump became president, was sworn in on January 20th, 2017. Therefore, my argument is that there is a presumption 
that what he did was an official act in furtherance of his duties as president. Sure, perhaps that can be rebutted. But the point is, this case should not have gone to trial until the issue of immunity was addressed, because now what we have is a basis to throw out the verdict by mere virtue of the fact that there is a presumption that should have been addressed before the trial. But in what way is involvement in these records an part of an official duty? Once Donald Trump became president of the United States, there is a presumption that his conduct was, was done in his official capacity as president. And, and to your and point, anything it, he does? It may, that, that presumption may be burst. That bubble may uh. be burst, but we start out with the, the same way he's presumed innocent. He, he's presumed to have immunity. And now it's up to the prosecution to burst that bubble. He wasn't given that opportunity. Okay, so so, or in the case being that he's presumed he's he's presumed immune as a starting point. That's I not think right. Is, uh, what Randy's saying. But we'll that's not that what on, the please. Supreme Court said. The Supreme Court created three categories. It said when it's carrying out an official constitutional power or statutory authority, there's absolute immunity. The court says when it's more at the reaches of presidential power, then there's a presumption. But the court also said that there is no immunity for the private or personal acts. What Randy has just said, that there's a presumption of immunity for anything the president does in office, is exactly what Chief Justice Roberts said the law is not. If it is a clearly private, personal, political act, there is no immunity under the court's decision of Trump. And who United determines States. that? A court. Here, what Donald Trump was convicted of doing was authorizing and causing the falsification of 34 business records to help himself get elected president. No matter how broadly you stretch official duties or even the outer reaches of presidential power, presumption, you can't fit this within that. To counsel's point, it may very well be that what Donald Trump did was not an official act, that it was an unofficial act, that it was a personal act. However, it is not for counsel to make that determination. It is not for counsel to make that decision. It's for a court to make that decision. And all I am saying is we have put the cart way before the horse. And in this particular instance, now that we know that, in fact, there is absolute immunity and there is presumptive immunity and then there is no immunity. And the Supreme Court has basically said, here are the guardrails. Here's the test. You trial courts, go employ them and go figure it out, which is exactly what's going to happen in the January 6th case and exactly what's going to happen in the documents case. And all I'm suggesting is it's what should have happened here as well. Justice Mershon, in light of this decision, was obligated to hold a hearing to determine whether or not there was absolute immunity presumptive immunity or no immunity using the test established by the Supreme Court. The claim of any immunity here is a truly frivolous argument. No matter how broadly you want to define a president's constitutional powers, asking that business records be falsified to help his political campaign doesn't relate to the authority of the president at all. If there'd be a hearing, it would take 30 seconds to be able to adjudicate. There's no relationship between falsifying these business records and anything that Donald Trump was doing in carrying out the presidency. If that theory were to hold true, there would no, be no reason to ever try a case of someone where the evidence appeared to be overwhelming. Why don't we just dispense with a trial, just convict the person and sentence them? A hallmark, the hallmark of our system of justice is. You are presumed innocent, no matter what anybody says, no matter what the legal pundits say, no matter what the lawyers say, no matter what the news outlets say. You are presumed innocent, no matter how ugly the case is. So according to counsel's argument, if it would take 30 seconds to have a hearing and a judge determine that these are unofficial acts, does that mean we dispense with hearings because there may be a quick decision? 
Maybe there wouldn't be. This isn't about the presumption of innocence. Donald Trump was presumed innocent until the jury convicted him on 34 counts. What we're talking about here is the scope of constitutional immunity. That's a legal argument for the judge. And of course, you're right, it'll be raised to the judge. But what I'm saying in the context of this debate to this audience, that it's a truly frivolous argument because it can't be said that ordering the falsification of business records so as to hide his hush money payment had anything to do with carrying out the powers of the presidency, no matter how broadly one would want to define that. Do you think that case could be made, Randy? I do think that case could be made, and that case is entitled to be but made. How, but but give, no, I, but right now I don't want to talk about the meta question of whether he has the right to do it or it's entitled to do it. What would be the what would be the case that could be made if you were his attorney in a, in the trial at this point? What would be the case that would be made that he was uh, he was immune because of, he had immunity from prosecution for f- falsifying records because it was part of his official duties? How does that work? To protect the office of the president. An argument could be made that he was being extorted. The former president has maintained, even during the debate, he never had sex with Stormy Daniels. And when it comes to Stormy Daniels, the unfair and prejudicial piling on of evidence that was salacious only, probative, not at all prejudicial, extraordinarily have we learned nothing from the Harvey Weinstein verdict I want to I want to break in because I, you I want to get to you uh, Erwin to respond to to what your response was that the official duty is to protect the office of the president reputationally or from extortion or other ways uh, are, are conceivable what about that Erwin if that's true then anything the president would ever do would be protected by absolute immunity by saying oh I was just acting to protect the office of the president Chief Justice Roberts made clear in Trump versus the United States that acts that are private or political aren't carrying out constitutional powers. And here I'd look at Chief Justice Roberts' opinion. He defined official duties as carrying out the powers of the president under the Constitution or statutory authority. This doesn't fit within that. And in terms of the Stormy Daniels testimony, the judge has wide discretion to decide what evidence to admit. It seems highly unlikely that a court's going to overrule a judge for allowing this evidence in. It seems to me then, and I'm going to rehash the argument I made a moment ago, and that simply is, it is not for me to determine, it is not for counsel to determine, it is not for anyone to determine other than the trial court. And that is exactly what the Supreme Court said with its decision. Send it back to the trial court for the trial court to determine whether or not there is proof that the former president was then cloaked in immunity. So that to me is the argument that I have not heard any rejoinder to. We are ignoring the fact that the former president, according to the Supreme Court's decision today, according to Chief Judge Roberts' decision, Donald Trump would be entitled to a hearing on the question of whether or not he had immunity. And if he didn't, so be it. But merely to say that it's a joke of an issue that does not say, let's not bother with a hearing. That to me is the one argument that again, we're kind of avoiding, we're dancing around it. Simply give the man a hearing. And if it turns out he didn't have immunity, great. My understanding is that we're trying the case to this audience, and this audience will decide. And on the merits of the issue, based on the law, what I've said is that the argument that Donald Trump asking falsification of records to hide his affair has any relationship to the powers of the presidency is a frivolous argument. Will Donald Trump get to have a hearing on it? Of course he will. But on the merits, I think there is no doubt for this audience or for the judge what the outcome is. This doesn't fit with an absolute immunity of a president. Erwin, there have been other objections raised to the way the trial was conducted. Um, and, and these were not brought up by Randy, I, I want to be clear. Um, but they include the fact that um, there, there was some pressure or criticism of Judge Marchand for not recusing himself because of uh, the, the case being made that he had made a uh, donation to a political organization that was sympathetic to the Democrats. And $35 and $15 went to, I think, to a political campaign. Um, what what about, does that have 
any concern for you in terms of uh, the vulnerability of this case to stand up? There had been an ethics ruling explicitly that the judge was not disqualified on the basis of this. Let's face it, $50 is de minimis, and it isn't a sufficient basis for saying that the judge was biased. And that's what had been previously ruled as a matter of ethics before Judge Marchand tried the case. And I'm right, Randy, that's not part of the argument that you're making today. It, it was not the primary argument. As I mentioned in my opening statement, what the issues of the appearance of impropriety and the conflict and other issues, what they do is they provide context in and of itself. That one issue may not be enough. The Supreme Court has said we cannot divide and conquer with individual arguments. We look at the totality of the circumstances. And here, when you bring in Justice Mershon's conflict, imagine if Justice Mershon had no conflict, did not have a family member who was a, a Democratic operative, had not made that contribution. Every decision he made would not be somehow colored by that appearance of impropriety. It would have been so easy for another judge to preside over this case that was not carrying that baggage. So therefore, the appearance of the impropriety, in, it infects every decision, including allowing Stormy Daniels to provide all of that testimony in allowing that indictment to stand and in the jury instruction. Uh, there was one other um, cr critique that was raised, Erwin, and again, I'd like to have Randy respond to it as well. And that was the fact that this trial took place in New York, that there was no way for Donald Trump to get a fair trial in New York City because of the political uh, disposition of the New York population, voting population. There is absolutely no basis in the law for that argument, because then it would say that no conservative could be tried in New York or no liberal can be tried in Mississippi. There was the proper jury selection process, and I cannot imagine any court ever accepting the argument that the overall ideology of a city is a sufficient basis for their concluding that there's a biased jury. My guess is on this, Randy and I will agree. We agree in isolation, agree 100%. But again, as I spoke a moment ago, it now becomes the totality of the circumstances. Standing alone, it is very difficult to argue with a straight face that the trial should have been moved someplace else because to counsel's argument, where I'm only going to try the case in a red state, I'm only going to try the case on Mars, of course not. But when you take that factor and now you put in the appearance of the impropriety, you put in the indictment, uh, which to me was constitutionally infirm, the testimony that was permitted, the fact that the jury was not required to come back unanimously on the offense conduct. Now the case starts to have legs from the perspective of, did the man get a fair trial? My answer to that is no. I'm here with lawyers Randy Zellin and Erwin Chemerinsky, who are currently arguing in our mock trial, simulating the potential arguments we'll hear in Trump's felony conviction appeal. I'd like now to bring in some other voices who have been listening to the arguments being made. They are legal experts themselves. They have thoughts on these uh, topics and a great deal of expertise. So we're looking forward to seeing what questions they want to ask of our two attorneys. And up first, we have Chara Torres uh, Spellacy. Chara is a professor of law at Stetson University and fellow at the Brennan Center of Justice and a past debater with us. So Char, it's great to have you back on Open to Debate. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> and uh, what question would you like to bring to our two attorneys? So I am fascinated by this tete-a-tete -tete, uh, because I wrote about Trump's New York case in my new book, Corporatocracy. I have a two-parter. I see this as a, a criminal conspiracy between Trump and American Media Inc., the owner of the National Enquirer. Number one, do you think it was just to give the National Enquirer a non-prosecution agreement for its violation of the Tillman Act? And then sort of relatedly, if there's an appeal from this case that makes it way to, its way to the Supreme Court, do you think the Supreme Court would use this as an opportunity to gut the Tillman Act, which currently bars corporations from giving money to federal candidates? Let me go to the latter question and then the former. Is the latter, I don't see the Supreme Court is gutting the Tillman Act. The Tillman Act, as I remember, was adopted in 1906, and it says that corporations can't contribute money to candidates 
The Supreme Court extended it to unions in the Taft-Hartley Act in the 1940s. The Supreme Court has consistently drawn a distinction between contributions and expenditures. The court has upheld restrictions on contributions by corporations and unions, but has said there can't be limits on independent expenditures. I don't see any likelihood the Supreme Court's going to overrule that distinction, which has been followed for so long. Now I can deal with your former question. I think it was a strategic choice by the prosecution, as often these strategic choices are made, in order to be able to get testimony at trial. The testimony was important in showing the motive of Donald Trump, indicating that what he was doing was to help get him elected as president of the United States. And so I understand why prosecutors give immunity so as to get people to testify. Fair enough. Thank you. Well, let me start out by saying that I am woefully overmatched when it comes to the Tillman Act. And, and I, I applaud uh, the, the deans uh, simply saying, well, if I remember correctly, and then citing a chapter and verse. <laughs> so I won't speak to the Tillman Act. What I will say is that for sure, Donald Trump was unduly prejudiced by the jury finding out that uh, the publisher of the Inquirer, American Media, was given a non-prosecution agreement by mere virtue of the jury hearing that. And I don't know what curative instruction could have possibly assuaged that burden shifting, that suddenly the presumption of innocence moving towards the presumption of guilt by virtue of that testimony. To me, that was needless and it was unfair. And I do believe that the appellate division will look closely at that. Uh, the dean talks about strategic moves. Well, that was one of a number of strategic moves that I think was ill-advised and maybe took a case that was winnable. And well, now we will see that case reversed because of strategic decisions like that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chara. Um, I now want to bring in uh, Catherine Glenn Foster. And Catherine is uh, president and CEO of First Rights Capital. Catherine, thanks so much for joining us. And please come in with your question. Pleasure to be here. Erwin, Randy, you have each argued, respectively, um, why this conviction should stand or why it should be overturned. If you were each on the other side making that opposing argument, what would your best argument be and why would you choose that strategy? Catherine, I love that question. Thank you for it. I think Randy makes the best argument that can be made, and that's that there wasn't sufficient specificity in the indictment or the jury instructions in terms of what were the offenses that were tied to falsifying business records that made this a felony. But to reiterate, that's not what you think is a is the winning argument. I just don't want those words in no. coming out of your mouth to ever to be used against you. Exactly. Now, I tried to answer the question that was <laughs> yes, put you did. to me. Right. Um, I think that this is flawed because I think when you look at the relevant Supreme Court cases, which I've quoted to you, that there was sufficient notice to Donald Trump of that for which he was being tried and that for which he was convicted. I don't think there is a strong due process argument here at all. Okay, Randy, same question to you. And again, you get to disavow the answer as soon as it comes and out of your I, mouth. And I, like don't, you I, I don't necessarily need to disavow it because much like Irwin, it is our obligation. It's our job to be able to argue both sides of an issue. That's how we make our best arguments. Mm -hmm. If I'm sitting in the dean's shoes, if I'm sitting in the, the shoes of the prosecution, my argument is one of common sense. And, and, and the, the dean spoke about that so eloquently. This is a case about common sense. And a jury, all a jury is asked to bring into the courtroom is their common sense and everyday life experiences. And anybody who thought for one moment that Donald Trump didn't know exactly what he was doing, that he was putting wheels in motion to pay off a porn star to keep his affair silent, knowing that all he needed, I, I'm on the heels of the Access Hollywood tape. Now I have to have this porn star come forward that I was having an affair while my wife was pregnant. There's no way in God's green earth I'm getting elected. There's only so much I can get away with. So the common sense argument of if it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. 
That to me really is the strongest argument. And everything else is procedural, delay, 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 nonsense, 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 distract, divert, diffuse. But ultimately, the case is simple. I got together with my fixer to take care of this problem so I could be elected president, period, full stop. All right, Catherine, thank you very much for joining us on Open to Debate. And now I want to uh, welcome Catherine Ross. And Catherine is professor at law at George Washington University, and she's an author who focuses a great deal on the First Amendment. Uh, Catherine, thanks for joining us on Open to Debate, and please come in with your question. Thank you for having me. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation to listen to. I. Uh, my question has to do with an argument that wasn't me. I was a bit surprised that Randy didn't talk about uh, the allegations that this case is somehow endangered because the prosecution made novel legal arguments and brought charges in a manner that has not been um, used before. And I wonder if uh, both of you could comment on what impact, if any, uh, the, the issue of novelty should have, and also what would happen to the law if we concluded that novel theories cannot be tested in indictments. Catherine, can you help us out um, for for people who don't understand the law to the degree that all, all of you do and explain what novel arguments were made and what was novel about them before we explored the theory behind your question? Fair enough. Um, yes. So uh, one of the novelties was actually using the statute's permission to piggyback this sort of offense, whether defined clearly or not, onto the business records problem in order to uh, talk about or to go after a felony that is not um, a direct business felony, which is the way this would normally be used. Um, and then the underlying uh, crimes that this conspiracy was uh, alleged to address and that jurors found it addressed include um, New York election law, which is also not frequently used, uh, the conspiracy to affect the election uh, is also a largely untested thing and whether or not New York State can prosecute with an underlying crime that is federal election law is also not entirely clear, but they weren't prosecuting a federal election law violation. So by novelty, you mean using laws, in, in applying laws in ways to prosecute crimes that have not been done, it's sort of like um, using a hammer as a fork. Um, it wasn't made for that necessarily, but it, it can serve if you absolutely want it to. I'd like to if take that If you can to, get your piece to your mouth, it may not be fork. polite, but it's a fork, right? Okay. Erwin, could you take that on first then? Just the, the notion of, an, of the novelty in the way that the law was applied and, and applied in this case and how it was constructed around the accusations. In itself, the novelty may present a vulnerability for the charges to stand? No, I don't think it presents a vulnerability. Under the law in a criminal case, the question always is, are the elements of the crime proven beyond a reasonable doubt? The New York Penal Statute here, Section 175.10, creates three elements. A false entry in a business record, an intent to defraud, and an intent to commit or conceal another crime. If those three elements are met and proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then novelty doesn't matter. The fact that the statute hasn't been used this way before has no legal significance unless a defendant could argue selective prosecution and show that there was a motive that's impermissible in initiating the prosecution. Donald Trump didn't at any point in the proceedings argue that this was selective prosecution, in part because it's almost impossible to be able to win a selective prosecution claim. And Randy, to you, the same question about Thank the novelty, you. impact of the novelty. I made a conscious decision to avoid using words like novelty because to me, Saying the word novelty in the context of a legal argument invites the connotation that I think that it evokes, that it's, it's, it's not important, it's, it's trite. I tried to articulate the novelty of the argument being 
that the prosecution went forward using the falsification of business record statute without ever articulating, as Irwin said, the third element, what that other crime was that was furthered or concealed. Even though the statute doesn't say that you've got to demonstrate it, in 36 years, I have never seen an indictment not articulate what the other crime is. For example, in the burglary statute, what is a burglary? It is a trespass with the intention of committing another crime once you're inside. The burglary statute doesn't say what that other crime is, but I have never seen an indictment. I have never been involved on either side of a case when it wasn't made clear five minutes into the proceeding what that other crime was. And same with the falsification of business records. The statute may be silent, but I've never seen an indictment silent. I've never seen a case go through the system where the prosecution never comes forward and says, uh, duh, this is what the crime was. And I've never seen a case tried where it's almost like we're playing three card Monty and we're not telling you um, what's underneath the shell. So to me, that was the novelty. I tried to do all of that without actually calling it a novelty. Thank you very much for your question, Catherine. We're going to go to closing statements in just a moment. But before we do, I want to hearken back to your opening statements in which, Erwin, you said, fundamentally, this appeal doesn't stand a chance. Um, you did not opine on that fact, Randy, nor were you obliged to by the question that we're asking, but I'm curious about it. You, you've made a pretty passionate argument for why um, wh why you feel that the president's rights were not protected. Do you feel in the real, in, in reality, that the appeal you're talking about would, would has any chance of succeeding? I do. And it is not as if for purposes of being a talking head on television, I would be lying if I've said I've never, not lied, but I've never taken a position for purposes of being on television that I didn't necessarily believe in. Part of my job as a defense attorney is not to judge. I go where the facts take me. I go where the evidence takes me. I don't necessarily have to believe if my client is guilty or not guilty or caught red-handed or not. If I want to be a judge, I'll put a black robe on. But it just so happens that in this particular case, and I am apolitical, I am not a Trump uh, surrogate. I am not a Trump proponent. I am not a Trump attorney. But I do believe that in this case, his procedural and substantive due process rights, and that is something that Irwin is a renowned expert on, and even did a law review, law review article for my alma mater, Toro talking about the example that I gave in opening statements about the parents whose child is taken away from them, their rights to procedural due process, their rights to substantive due process. This indictment did not tell Donald Trump what that other crime was that he committed that elevated the misdemeanor to a felony. And those jury instructions okay. gave the and jury three different choices. All, all right. I, I, I want to, again, in the interest of time, come back to Irwin just to ask you to assess the confidence of your opponent that was just expressed. I think this is an appeal very unlikely to succeed. I think that in this instance, when you look at the case law, under it, the notice that was given to Donald Trump was more than sufficient. All right, thank you. Now we're going to move to our closing statements in which each of you has one more opportunity to make your argument in a closing format. Uh, Randy, you have the floor first, and you have two minutes. Thank you. If it please the court, I will begin my ending as I ended my beginning. And that is Donald J. Trump was entitled to know what it was that he did wrong. He was entitled to know in that indictment whether he committed the criminal offense conduct of state tax law fraud whether he committed the violation of state election law fraud or whether he committed violations of the federal election law. 
it was impossible for him to adequately defend himself without knowing what the offense conduct was that it is alleged that he engaged in that elevated the misdemeanor of making those false entries to a felony. He was entitled to that notice during the trial. He was not given that notice. He was not informed of what he did and what he did that was wrong. And the bookend, the other side, the flip side of that coin, and the final nail in the coffin of this verdict was the fact that this jury was not required to decide unanimously what that underlying offense conduct was. And we will never know what each of those jurors decided, what in fact that other offense conduct was. For all we know, four jurors decided that the underlying offense conduct was violation of state election law. Four of them could have decided that it was a violation. Nope, not of uh, federal uh, of state election law. It was a violation of federal election law. Four others could say, nope, you're both wrong. You're all wrong. Eight of you are wrong. It was a violation of state tax law. That is anathema to every fiber of our criminal justice system. Notice an opportunity to be heard. Due process. The Fifth Amendment guarantees it. The Sixth Amendment guarantees it. And it's guaranteed to all of us by virtue of the 14th Amendment. Take away my liberty. I damn well need to know what it is that I did wrong and an opportunity to, to defend myself and to know that I can't be tried again. And a unanimous jury. It is a cornerstone of our system of justice. Thank you very much. And now, Erwin, please, your closing statement. It's been a pleasure to be part of this debate. Ultimately, as was said, this is about common sense. This is about three things. First, did Donald Trump authorize the payment of hush money to Stormy Daniels so as to hide their affair? Second, did he then authorize the falsification of 34 business records to hide this having been done? And third, did he do this so as to help get elected as president of the United States? The evidence was overwhelming at trial as to all of these. Donald Trump did authorize the payment of hush money. He did cause the falsification of business records, and he did do it to help himself get elected president of the United States. So now to answer Randy's arguments, the first question is, did Donald Trump know that what this was the case was about? Certainly the indictment let him know what it was about. The opening statements let him know what it was about. The evidence let him know what it was about. And the closing arguments let him know what it was about. In fact, anyone who paid any attention to the trial knew it was about these three factors. All the Constitution requires is reasonable notice, and surely Donald Trump knew this. The second problem with Randy's argument is it ignores the case law. I've cited to you specific cases that refute Randy's position here. For instance, in Shad versus Arizona, the Supreme Court said that a criminal indictment need not specify which overt act among several named was the means by which a crime was committed. People versus Deveris in New York in 2009 said, Indi identifying the separate crime is not necessary for reasonable notice. Earlier in the debate, I quoted McKay versus North Carolina that says it's permissible for juries to combine findings on alternative means of satisfying the requirement. It doesn't require that each juror come to the same conclusion with regard to what was the basis for the crime. Randy never discusses the cases and they make it clear. Ultimately, as I said, this is a case about common sense. I think the New York appellate courts are going to say Donald Trump clearly knew this is about whether he authorized the payment to Stormy Daniels, whether he hid it in falsified business records, and whether he did it get elected as president of the United States. In light of that, they're going to say convictions affirmed. Thank you, Erwin. And with that, we are adjourned. And I'd like to thank our two attorneys for taking part in this mock trial program. Randy and Erwin, thank you so much for bringing your expertise uh, and your experiencing as practicing lawyers 
uh, to a question that is very, very important to the public right now. I found the exercise of each of you taking the other side's argument fascinating and enlightening and in some ways very encouraging. It was a privilege to be on with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much for participating. Likewise. Very much enjoyed And it. I want to thank our audience for um, taking part in listening. And um, before I do that, I want to thank our guests, Catherine, Chara, and Catherine, for contributing your expert questions and insights. And I want to thank you, our audience, for tuning into this special episode of Open to Debate. You know, as a nonprofit, our work to combat extreme polarization through what you just saw, civil and respectful debate, is generously funded by listeners like you, by the Rosencrantz Foundation, and by supporters of Open to Debate. Robert Rosencrantz is our chairman. Clea Connor is our CEO. Leah Mathow is our chief content officer. Elizabeth Kitzenberg is our chief advancement officer. This episode was produced by Alexis Pangrazi and Marlette Sandoval. Editorial and research by Gabriella Mayer and Andrew Foote. Andrew Lipson and Max Fulton provided production support, and our team also includes Eric Gross, Gabrielle Yanacelli, Rachel Kemp, and Linda Lee. Damon Whittemore mixed this episode. Our theme music is by Alex Clement, and I'm John Donvan. We'll see you next time on Open to Debate.